Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and I'm sitting in our Polestar 2 in front of a Volvo dealership. I had to come in to get a spare key coded. You can't do it yourself like in a Tesla, but at least that's sorted now. And given I'm a decent distance away from the office, I thought this would be a great opportunity to show you around the latest software on these Polestars. Because just like with computers and smartphones, these cars now do evolve. And obviously, when you look at some of the reviews online, they would have been done when the cars initially came out. But Polestar has been really good with regular and feature-packed software updates. If you want to see the exact changes in each one, I will leave a link in the description directly to the Polestar website because they do actually provide a proper software change log. But a list of features is one thing, how they work in practice is another. So let me show you this 2.10 update as of July 2023. To be fair, it's the previous version 2.9 which brought a lot of improvements. Like for example, now if we go into apps, you can watch YouTube on the built-in screen, but let's not worry about YouTube. I will fasten my seatbelt because the interesting stuff will happen once we get going on the road. And I will also make sure to have my phone plugged in. The Polestar still does not support wireless CarPlay, but at least the wired connection is quite reliable. I heard that there were some possible glitches and a bit of lagginess with 2.9. I haven't experienced any of that with this latest 2.10 software version. Love having the map right in front of me on the instrument cluster. One of the benefits of a Polestar 2 over something like a Tesla Model 3. The other new thing which was introduced with 2.9 were improvements to the range assistant app. I believe off the top of my head we are now on the third iteration. The first one was quite rubbish. It was very convoluted, difficult to read while on the move. The second one, I actually showed you that one on my way down from Scotland. So click the link in the top right hand corner of the video to see how that journey went. But basically, if I go into it, it shows you the projected range and your instantaneous consumption. This was quite handy and it also gave you tips on how much your air conditioning was using, how fast you were driving and so on, if you wanted to really, really stretch your mileage. However, if you look closely, there's this new arrow icon. So if I click that, the view expands and now I get a more traditional graph of energy consumption over distance. And I can choose the scale between 20 miles, last 40 miles or 100 miles. The car hasn't been driven that much since the update, so we can leave it on the last 20 miles. The weather is quite mild today, about 25 degrees Celsius shown in the instrument cluster, and we have been doing a mixture of dual carriageways, motorways and country roads to get to the dealership. And you see the average consumption is only 23 kilowatt hours per 100 miles. It does show the Polestar can be efficient, especially true for the single motor long range version. The graph also shows you how much of the energy was used on driving and how much on climate. I suppose something which is a bit more important in winter months. However, if you have seen our previous video, we'll be test drove a BMW i3 with and without a heat pump side by side in winter, you will know that they don't make that much of a difference. But it's always nice to see how much energy is used for heating or cooling of the cabin. Other than your average consumption, you also get your projected range. And now you will find this a little bit confusing if you are new to electric cars and especially the Polestar or Teslas for that fact. Because if I look at the instrument cluster, the car is now reporting 150 miles of available range. But if I look here, it's obviously showing 130 miles. Even if I get out of this projected range, 130 miles. So what's that about? Well. Polestar and Tesla display range a bit differently to a normal petrol or a diesel car. The range shown in the instrument cluster by default is basically like a fixed conversion from percentage in the battery to miles of range. However, what that means is that if you're using a lot of energy, more than what was calculated for that standardized range on a test cycle, for example, driving at motorway speeds in the winter, you will start losing that range a lot quicker than you expect. And it can be a little bit concerning. As seasoned EV drivers, we prefer to work in percentages anyways, but if you need that little bit of helping hand in the instrument cluster to know that you are going to make it to your destination, you can now go into settings in the range manager app and you can choose to change the rated range into projected range. And now it will match the 130 miles it says in the range assistance screen. By the way, this Polestar is super smooth and refined, even at 70 miles per hour. As I mentioned in my Scotland video, there's no doubt this is an area where the Polestar 2 is better than the Tesla. And this one in particular is actually on the 19 inch wheels instead of 20s. So it's even quieter still and more comfortable over bumps. Anyways, I'm not trying to sell you this one. I believe someone has already placed a deposit on it and it's just pending the final finance approval. 
great. So that's the Ranger system covered. Small improvements, but I would say quite meaningful, and they will make the overall experience a bit better for especially new EV drivers. Next up, as you can see, obviously, I'm using the Google Maps for navigation. If you're not aware, I think Polestar was actually the first car to come out with a built-in Google Android automotive system, so you get the benefit of some Google services like Google Maps and Google Assistant. But as I mentioned, you do have the option to use Apple CarPlay, so if I go into the home screen and jump into the CarPlay tile, you see you've got your familiar CarPlay interface and we can switch to, for example, Apple Maps, which automatically suggests that I should navigate to work. Yes, please. Go. And now if you look carefully on the instrument cluster, Google Maps have been replaced by Apple Maps interface. So that means, again, I can get out of Apple Maps on the center screen and I still have my Maps view in the display right in front of me so I know where to go. A couple of nuances of Apple Maps versus Google Maps when it comes to the interface. Obviously, this is pumped from the iPhone. So if I disconnected the phone, I would lose that view and all the navigation on the built-in screens. But this is really neatly integrated and there are now more and more cars coming out with proper CarPlay integration across multiple screens. You do get a little pill at the bottom of the screen in front of the driver, which gives you the estimated time of arrival, the time and distance to destination, which is very handy because the Google Maps interface does not show that. However, you do not get your turn-by-turn -turn directions, the little banners with countdown to every intersection and which lane to be in, up on the screen ahead of you. It's a bit of a shame because Siri mentioned that I should take an exit soon. However, I don't know how many miles I still have left to go. For that, I still need to go into the CarPlay interface and I exactly see I'm still eight miles away. I know Apple Maps can be quite controversial, but especially around London, the mapping quality is very good. And in fact, these are so-called high resolution maps. So if you zoom in really close, you will see individual lane markings, yellow box junctions and things like that directly in the digital map. So it makes it a bit easier to navigate the city if you are not familiar with the road layouts. However, I hear you, you do not want to use Apple Maps. You are a Waze fanboy, just like our manager is. So let's end the route here. And if I go into my CarPlay again and use Waze, let's see what happens then. This is a work call, so I will have to blur out the number because of GDPR. But you can see that now, even though it's a, it was a CarPlay phone call, I could use the steering wheel controls to accept or reject the call right in the interface in the instrument cluster. Why is everybody driving so slowly? And if I click work, you see, I've got my trusty Waze interface, which many people love. You've got all the options like you normally know from CarPlay. You can report different things and so on. But the instrument cluster went back to Google Maps. And that's because as of right now, the only app which I believe supports mirroring onto the instrument cluster screen as well is just Apple Maps. So if you use any of the other third party apps like Google Maps through CarPlay or Waze and so on, those still run in the old fashioned mode where you just have them in the middle screen, I'm afraid. Even when I zoom out the view, I do not get any countdown to intersection information like in the banner on the top right hand corner in the Waze interface. That's fine though, but you may be asking, wait a second, this has the Google Play Store built in, so if I use CarPlay, why not run Waze natively? Well, we can try that as well. And I will show you again, it's not that simple. So I will cancel the navigation with the Waze on my phone. And if I go into my Polestar apps, I have downloaded Waze already. As I said, I just needed to log in with my Google account and it's just like downloading apps onto your Android smartphone. And I'm logged in with my personal account so it knows my home, work address and so on. So let's go back to work. And beautiful. I know I'm ULS compliant, I can confirm that and it's navigating like you would expect it to. As you can see, the look is slightly different, but it's still very much the ways we know, running natively. So in this case, even if I unplug the phone, that will keep on working. And I do get a countdown to every intersection in the middle of the screen, but no map. So even if I try to go into the map view, you can see the screen stays dark and I just get a countdown to the junction I need to take. A bit of a shame because I thought, okay, it took quite a while to get ways in the Play Store for Android Automotive. So I thought, hey, it's probably because they're taking their time to get it right. 
but I'm afraid that's not the case. It very much runs just like a third party app. It's still nice that you can obviously use the other ways features like reporting incidents and so on, but that's it, I'm afraid. Also crucial is that I tried putting a destination very far away, like I think Edinburgh, and Waze obviously will guide you there happily, but unlike the built-in Google Maps, it doesn't give you charging stop information and it can't preheat the battery for charging. So again, it's useful for local journeys, but for long journeys when you need to rely on the built-in route planning and guidance from the inbuilt infotainment about how much range you will have left at your destination, that's still very much a Google Maps exclusive feature. Arthur Kaminsky said any luck. Would you like to reply? Yes. What do you want to say to Arthur Kaminsky? Yes, comma, all sorted and I'm on my way back and filming, full stop. Your WhatsApp message says, yes, all sorted and I'm on my way back and filming. Send it. Yes, please. Done. You see, voice control, it's the future. It's on that topic, the built-in Google Assistant, if I say something like, Navigate to work using Waze. Sorry, I didn't understand. It doesn't know that, and it doesn't seem to integrate with the third-party apps, really. So, I would still say, try to get used to Google Maps if you want to get the most out of the built-in system. You may be wondering, then, what's the point of downloading the built-in Waze application if you can run it through CarPlay, because you don't get any additional integration with the rest of the vehicle. Even when you have an iPhone, I would say the phone doesn't drain as much battery, so that's benefit number one. And most importantly, we can't forget about Android users, because there is no Android auto mirroring on these Polestars, because the assumption is that being a Google system, you can just log into everything directly in the car, and up until recently you couldn't get Waze, so now you have the option to use Waze built-in, and you do not have to have an iPhone. And now that we are approaching London, let's see, is there anything else we want to discuss? Let me go into all the apps I have installed, because I did download a couple of other ones as well to show you. So other than the ones which we already went through, you can now download Electroverse directly to the Polestar. Electroverse is a charging app in the UK, which basically groups all the chargers available into one. It's a bit like ZapMap. And in fact, it has gotten really good in the recent last couple of updates, so it may replace ZapMap for us. Let us know whether you would like to see a video covering that topic. You get a nice map and there are charging pins so you can see where there are chargers nearby. Obviously, Google Maps can do this as well, but in here you can go into the filters and you have a bit more granular control about which chargers you want to see. So, for example, I want to see all chargers, even the ones which are not partnered with Electroverse. If I go back out, I can zoom in and out and, crucially, tap on any of them to see more details, and it gives you everything. This is really important because you can, again, run the Electroverse app through CarPlay as well, but I think it's because of Apple's limitations, this functionality is not available. You can't scroll through the map, use multi-touch to pinch to zoom and so on. So it's a bit more clunky to navigate. It's easy to find the nearby ones, but here you can exactly see what's en route. And if you want to, you can even directly navigate to one. So for example, let's see this one. BP Pulse, sure, navigate and it will start the navigation. A bit of a bummer is that you can't select which mapping app you want to use. So I hope will happen in future software versions is that you will be able to click navigate and you will get a pop-up saying do you want to use Google Maps or Waze or whatever else to navigate because now you're using some kind of third-party navigation app which obviously will not be as good as all the other options but at least we are heading in the right direction. Perfect. And lastly, a battery route planner. So let's go into all apps, ABRP. If you don't know, a battery route planner makes any car work almost like a Tesla, where it automatically suggests where to stop to charge, what percentage you will arrive with, and how long you need to stay for. But if you use it with your phone or just your laptop to plan your journeys in advance, it obviously relies on a little bit of estimation about how you will be driving, what the weather will be like, and so on to predict your consumption. Whereas here, it takes a while to load. It's not the fastest of systems, but for example, if I want to navigate from my position to Glasgow, I can click Calculate Route. The interface is exactly the same, really, 
and it crashed. Of course. Even though I haven't really experienced any crashes with the first party apps, some of this third party support is still a little bit glitchy, I would say. So I would need to restart the screen now. But you will basically get the same interface as on desktop. But the app does have access to the car's exact state of charge live. So it can adjust the prediction based on how much energy you're consuming and advise you if you need to stop sooner, replan your journey, drive a bit slower, anything like that. But let's get rid of that. Hey Google, navigate to work. Navigating to work. You are on the fastest route despite some traffic. You should reach your destination by 1418. This is how you expect a modern system to work. I don't need to fumble with the screen. I can just use my voice. It understands me. I don't need to shout at it. I don't need to learn certain phrases. It all just works. And you can see that here in the Google Maps interface, I can see that I should take the exit in 0.5 miles towards central London, but I do not get the exact estimated time of arrival, time remaining to destination, miles remaining to destination and so on. So for that, I still need to have the big screen up with the detail there, including the fact that I will have 45% remaining when I get to the office. So what's the conclusion? I'm afraid there is no conclusion. I just wanted to show you around all the options because I haven't found any other videos showing this in detail online about what the limitations are of every app. But if I had to say something to wrap up the video, it's definitely that the built-in Google Maps is still the way to go on these pole stars, whether it be for long distances or even just driving around the city with the view you have in the instrument cluster. Let us know what you think. Is there any must-have app which you could see coming to Google Play Store on the Android automotive platform which would really transform the way you drive? Let us know in the comments. We look forward to seeing what you come up with. And as always, thank you very much for watching. If you found the video helpful, give it a thumbs up. And otherwise, see you in the next one.